Howdy folks, so this is part two to my question and answer videos. This is the answer video. Um, so at one point there was like a hundred and something comments on that video and then it magically went down to 80, so I have no idea what happened, but uh, there really hasn't been any new comments uh, in the last 24 hours or so. So I'm going to, this is Friday when I'm filming this, so I'm just gonna do it now uh, because we're gonna have a storm and I don't wanna be filming in the middle of a thunderstorm. That would be kind of distracting. Um, so I am just going to going to be going through all these questions in the order that they were posted in. I think that's the most most interesting and most fair. And if your question does not get answered, it's either because you were too late, uh, you know, you posted it after this video, or uh, either it was inappropriate or you were obviously trolling. But uh, the comments actually stayed pretty sane for uh, YouTube standards, so that's uh, that's pretty good. So the first question uh, says, any videos you've had to scrap? If so, what were they? Uh, yes, I have scrapped a lot of videos. Um, usually if I film something and then I, I'm either editing it and I realize the footage is garbage, I will just trash it. Or if I edit it and I go, this is boring, no one, I wouldn't want to watch this, then I won't publish it because I don't think uh, it's useful. I'm not going to put out garbage content. I try to maintain some level of, of quality standards, right? Uh, I'm, some things will go on my second channel, but if if there's stuff that I still won't even let on my second channel. There were, uh, in, in, to give you like specific examples, like there was one video I did where I ran, um, I tried to run ZFS on Windows in a VM with physical disks from like a pool that was built in another system. And I mean, it ended up working and everything, but the footage was just so terrible that I just never, I just didn't want to cut it together. So. I mean, there's just, it's a bunch of little, like little things that I, I do and, you know, I just get the camera out and realize it's not really worth, not really worth doing. Um, do you have an A plus certification? No, I do not. Um, and then the thing that everybody asks, this is a very big repeat question, what is your day job? So I work as a, an embedded system software design engineer, primarily. Um, so basically I write firmware for embedded systems. So an embedded system is basically any, any device with a computer in it, right? That fits the definition of a computer. So that is something that has, you know, a processor memory and IO. So, um, that, that's, that is what I do. Um, you know, I, I do dabble in hardware to some extent, you know, you do need hardware knowledge to do firmware, but I'm primarily a software developer. Um, this person asked a bunch of things, um, I'd like to know some side projects that I've worked on in the past, uh, apart from the videos I have. Um, all of my old projects are kind of boring. Um, I, I I don't really think there's that many things worth talking about. Honestly, I mean, I did. I've I've done uh, some FPGA like experimentation with FPGAs and image processing. Um, that's when I discovered I'm not really good enough at math to do DSP stuff. I um, I've done things like line of sight optical data transmission projects, um, where I would transmit data with. I I, I built a basically a, a, a line of sight laser data transmission system using parts they bought exclusively at the dollar store, which was quite funny. Um, and I was able to get I think it was about 120 baud at 100 meters with a dollar store laser diode, and uh, you know, it's a pretty wide Gaussian beam, so it was pretty impressive that I was able to do that. But my old projects are boring. Um, I'm not going to bother to go into them. Um, what am I studying? What line of work are you in? Um, I'm not studying anything anymore. I have a Bachelor of Applied Science. Um, what I, I did study computer engineering when I was in university. Um, and uh, I've already answered that question. Do I have a Twitter handle? No, I don't use Twitter. Um, to be honest, Twitter, I think, is the most acceptable social network that is out there, but I don't have it. Um, YouTube is pretty much the only place you're going to find me. Um, and this isn't a question, but you want more updates on my blog. Yes, I know my blog is awful. Um, I created it a long time ago. I never really update it. So it's, it's one of those things I kind of want to completely rebuild. Like, it's written in WordPress, so it's not very good to begin with. Uh, but I... I don't know. I find it's it's honestly easier for me to film things and edit them than to type them. But there's a lot of things that really only make sense if I type them. So it's a thing that is just, I'll get to it at some point, but I have no plans to do it in the immediate future. 
Um, how and when did you get into electronics? So I originally, ever, like basically ever since I was a kid, I knew that I wanted, um, I really knew that I really liked mechanical stuff. So I, I, I always liked big machines and equipment and stuff. Um, I wanted to be a garbage truck driver when I was little because they worked with big machines. So that's kind of funny. But uh, I, I, I always liked mechanics and stuff like that. And I always wanted to see how stuff worked. My parents hated me because I took apart all my toys. And they ultimately never went back together again. And so I, I kind of had this, this drive to figure out how stuff worked. And then I got my first computer and I sort of you know learned how, how, how software kind of worked. And then I actually uh, started writing software because I didn't have really any money as a kid. So I would write software because you know, software is basically free to develop. And so I got involved with software and I kind of understood how that worked. And then once I had enough money, um, I started buying hardware. And, and I think the first, I think the first IC I ever bought was a triple five timer at my local Radio Shack. That was back when Radio Shack still existed. And you could buy like ICs in an individual pack. And so I, I started learning circuits at that point, uh, all on my own, you know, using the internet. And uh, I, I kind of worked my way up in, in my comfort level of what I could do until I got my first microcontroller. And from then I started writing embedded software and that's when I started learning, you know, how, how firmware really works, how operating systems work. And that was when I kind of realized that, you know, even though I did not done a lot of software, I really liked software. Um, I also really liked the hardware aspect and firmware was kind of this, uh, this sort of middle ground where you kind of needed knowledge from both areas and you know you could still you know work with your hands but also you know do software and so I know I'm now sort of sort of answering a different question but I'm sure that will come up at some point so this answer is still relevant um, but basically it was just uh, a progression from from software to hardware to then software running on bare metal hardware um, but I was I got into electronics very early uh, in life uh, long before I took anything formal in uh, in edu in like education, even in high school. Um, how did I learn all of this? Uh, did you go to school? Are you self-taught? I would say that I'm mostly self-taught. Uh, I've said this before, I think, but I think that school ultimately t like teaches you how to learn. Um, it teaches you how you get information into your brain uh, and how to, may maybe it also gives you a bit of overview of what's out there to learn about, but it doesn't actually teach you the things you need to get things done. Uh, ultimately, you're, it's up to you to do that. And so I've always followed kind of a, like a just-in-time learning type situ situation, just kind of like just-in-time compiling, right? I, I, I know what I need to search out and learn in order to get a task done. I'll search it out, learn it, and then do the task. And doing that rapidly, I think, is the best skill you can have. And I think that's what school really should teach you, um, but everything else is primarily uh, self-taught using those kinds of skills. Um, would you recommend, uh, what would you recommend for a cheap PFSense box? Do you like those embedded solutions that NetGate offers? Um, I don't really know of any like cheap PFSense boxes um, just off the top of my head. I think that that NetGate stuff is probably the best. I mean, they do corporately sponsor PFSense um, and buying the the systems they have, I think they're very cost effective. Um, they for, for the hardware you get for the price plus all the support and everything, uh, it's a no brainer. I mean, if you're in if you're in an industry, if like you're in a business or something, just buy it. I mean, don't need, like don't even bother to build your own. Uh, just just buy one of their appliances. It's just worth it. Um, I'm, and I'm not being made to say that. I think that is literally the best way to do it um, because it's kind of a no no hassle thing, right? And they're very power efficient, like m better than you're going to be able to do if you build something. And now they've got their arm box that they've got out now, um, you know, which is just you know it's tiny. It's smaller than Raspberry Pi, and I think that's you know that's good enough for probably most people, I mean, almost all homes and even small businesses could probably run off of that. So, you know, yeah, I, I, I fully support the stuff that they have. So next question is, uh, what is your favorite slash least favorite project that you've worked on and why? Um, this is not an easy question to answer. Uh, it's very subjective and I'm probably forgetting a lot of the projects I've done. Um, plus there's a bunch of stuff that's work related that of course I can't talk about, but I'd say the least favorite thing that I worked on was probably 
uh, I got a Lattice FPGA dev kit a couple years back. And dev kits are supposed to be easy to use. They're supposed to be well documented because they're supposed to basically be a sales tool, right? And Lattice fucked that up so hard that I got so frustrated trying to use this thing. I almost bricked the FPGA. Um, and I ultimately just ended up never using it again. So it was just supposed to be a, just a demo project and it did not go well. And so, I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's my least favorite project that I can remember anyway. Um, what is my favorite project? Um, I would say if I have to define favorite, I'd say by like maybe most used, um, that would be uh, this right here. This is a Clementine Music Player, which is an open source cross-platform uh, music player library manager. And uh, I've been, I've been sort of on the dev team for like four years now, I think, for this. Um, I haven't done nearly as much as a bunch of other people, so I'm not taking massive amounts of credit for it. But it it's a great uh, piece of software. Um, I mean, it, it's based off of Amrock 1.4, but it was totally rewritten, basically, in Qt 4.8. Um, really, really nice piece of software. So uh, because I literally use it all the time, I mean, literally have a monitor both here and at work dedicated to it, basically. Um, it's, you know, I think I'd say it's my favorite just because I get the most use out of it above, over and above every other project I've probably ever done, even though it is only a, you know, a pure software project. Um, let's see, duplicate question, duplicate question. Um, let's see, not gonna answer that one. Did you ever use Windows, then change to Linux? If so, why the move? Um, yeah, of course I used Windows before Linux because as a kid, I didn't know that Linux existed. Um, I, my first computer ran Windows 98, it ran Windows 98, and I ended up breaking that because there's apparently a way that you can totally brick the graphics subsystem of Windows 98 by doing nothing but clicking buttons. So uh, I ended up having to move to Windows XP on a different machine. And I used that for a while until, until the rumors of Windows Vista started coming out. Back then it was called Windows Longhorn, I think. That was the code name for it. And because, um, you know, everyone was speculating what Windows Vista was going to look like. And, you know, all they had was all these the concept art and all this other stuff. And, you know, ultimately Vista was kind of pretty. You know, it had the arrow glass and all that other kind of stuff, which, you know, of course, was, ooh, so fancy for the time. But uh, I wanted that look now on Windows XP and of course you, know, you get like the icon packs and stuff and a friend of mine mentioned that there's this other operating system called Linux and uh, you can make it look like whatever you want and so I was intrigued I didn't know about this other operating system so I sort of researched it and I ended up I think the first version of Linux I think I ever tried was Nopix um, and it, I think it ran like KDE 3 or something and I mean, I didn't have 3D graphics. The machine I was running did not have any 3D graphics at all. So it was pretty boring looking. But as soon as I upgraded my machine at that point, I, uh, I installed Ubuntu uh, 6.06. 6 and, uh, you know, this was back when, you know, there was Compiz and Barrel, and then they'd recently formed Compiz Fusion. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of old school Linux people will, will remember the Compiz compositor and all of the fun graphic effects you could do with it, you know, the wobbly windows, the desktop cube, the painting fire, all that stuff. And uh, that that was what drew me to it. That was, that was the initial reason why I tried Ubuntu. And I stayed with Linux, of course, because I realized this is what I wanted right from the beginning. I just didn't know it existed. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people used to say that, you know, Compass and all that fancy stuff was just kind of useless and, you know, just wank factor, but I think that there's a lot of people now that do use Linux because of that kind of wank factor. I mean, I would have probably found and switched to Linux regardless at some point. I just think that uh, I switched sooner because of that. Um, and I I haven't used Windows since. I, I don't have any Windows machines left, uh, nothing like that. I mean, I have Windows in a VM at work because we use, like, we use Outlook. Um, but you know, even with all the Office 365 stuff in the web browser, I'm thinking that maybe, maybe one day, uh, that won't even be necessary at all. Do you use GitHub? Um, I do have a GitHub account. There's not really anything you're going to find there. It's mostly garbage code. Um, I prefer to use GitLab. Uh, I run my own Git server, so it's uh, it's private. Um, I, I will be putting some stuff on GitHub, though. Because, like I said, I'm going to be open sourcing a bunch of projects, and so I think I'm going to put it on GitHub just because 
um, you know, that's where people look for stuff. So I'm just going to put it there just because it's it's more popular, basically. Um, and duplicate questions. So the next question is uh, Coke or Pepsi? And uh, actually, it's both. Uh, I really don't have a preference. Um, I mean, they both give you diabetes just as quickly, so I don't really care. Um, any suggestions uh, what to look for when buying a new phone? I generally only care about cell phones when I'm actually buying a phone, because ultimately it's just too much information and crap I don't care about. Um, I still use my LG G4, I own that, I'm gonna keep that until it dies. Um, but as far as you know, suggestions what to look for, I mean, for me, the phone has to have a headphone jack with a decent DAC in it, and micro SD card slot, and pretty much everything else, I think all of the manufacturers seem to agree on, right? You know, a screen that doesn't suck, cameras that don't suck, you know. The removable battery used to be a thing that I was very adamant about, but unfortunately I don't think it's really realistic to always request that now, because pretty much all phones don't have that anymore, um, which is, it's unfortunate, but you know, what are you gonna do? But other than that, there's not really, not really anything else I can recommend. Um, how do you shuffle hobbies and work? I wish I knew an answer to this question, but I really don't. Um, you know, because I, I mean, you work all day with tech and then you come home and then you got to do tech projects and it's kind of like, I really don't want to do that. So what I find kind of works is I do those tech projects on the weekends. So, you know, when I come home from work, I just want to relax, watch TV or YouTube videos or, or, or something like, like that or chores or whatever. And then it's the weekend when I don't have to go to work that I will do the tech projects. And that kind of separates them a bit. Plus, you know, you can go on, you know, late night coding rampages and, you know, you don't go, oh shit, it's 3 a.m. I have work tomorrow morning. Um, you don't have those kinds of problems. But that's the best advice I can give. I really don't know, uh, to be honest. If anyone actually knows how to shuffle hobbies and work better than that, I'd love to know. Um, this is a very weird question. How would you about go about getting code from a prom chip from an ECM from the 80s? Dude wants to make it with a Raspberry Pi. How do you design interface between old wiring and the new ECM? Okay, it kind of sounds like you don't really know what you're talking about. Um, no offense. Uh, ECM, I'm assuming, is like electronic control module or something? You can't just grab code out of an E-squared problem and run on a Raspberry Pi. I hope you know that. Um, you're going to need to emulate whatever processor the original system was using. And because it's probably a real-time system, you're going to need to make sure that the emulator runs in step with the original system clock. And the inter electrical interface is just, I mean, it's going to be entirely system dependent, so I, I can't help you there, sorry. Um, I see you're using Unity. Uh, how are you going to emigrate to GNOME? Uh, I kind of already have. Um, like I, I've mentioned before, all of my servers now run Debian, and of course I love that. But all my other workstations, not this machine, they all run Debian as well, and they run GNOME Shell. Because I personally hate Unity with a passion. I have always hated Unity. Ever since it was just in their netbook edition, I have not liked Unity. Um, I only use Unity because it's better than KDE. <laughs> and GNOME Shell on Ubuntu is kind of broken. Um, like, if you just install GNOME Shell on a regular Ubuntu install, it's kind of fucked up. Um, and I never really bothered to go with that, like, Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu uh, GNOME Edition thing, which is now going to be merged into Ubuntu, of course, now that they're going with GNOME. So, uh, I upgrade my servers every four years and my workstation every two years. And so, this is running 16.04, so I was going to keep this uh, at 16.04 until 2018, where I was then going to either switch, but originally I was going to switch to Debian at that point. But now that Ubuntu is using GNOME, uh, if they don't manage to royally screw up 17.10, then I'm probably just going to reinstall 18.04 and just use GNOME Shell natively on Ubuntu because I think Ubuntu still makes a better desktop platform than Debian does, uh, just because it moves along a little bit quicker. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have I have no I, have, I I was very ecstatic when I heard that news because uh, it also makes work a lot easier too because we use Ubuntu at work so. Um, you know, not having to, you know, now being able to use GNOME Shell at work is also really great. I think left or right, I think that means politics, so I'm not going to answer that question. I also don't live in the States. Um, tab or space, 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 space. <laughs> okay, so ultimately I don't care because ultimately 
my IDE, I just hit the tab key and it just automatically inserts whatever's supposed to go there. Um, my IDE is configured to insert spaces, but they don't act like spaces, they act like tabs because the IDE manages it. And the only reason why I do that is because a lot of times I'll need to open a file on a system that either doesn't have an IDE or it's not configured right, um, like you know some sort of embedded Linux or whatever, I just have to open something up and I want them to look kind of the same, so spaces look the same everywhere. Uh, but your IDE makes it irrelevant, so it's not as big of a question as uh, you might think. Uh, what keyboard key switches do you use? I use Cherry MX Blue switches, so official Cherry switches. None of this, you know, like fake clone switches. I know Razer's got their own like switches they're designing now. Um, I want like official proper Cherry MX Blue switches. Uh, I've tried a bunch of other Cherry switches. I've tried the reds and the blacks, um, and I don't like those. I have another keyboard with browns in it, and it's awful. Um, I really need the tactile and the audible feedback, so the blues are pretty much the best thing I've found so far. I, I know that there's other things out there that I think there's like clear and stuff, but I, I've never actually found the keyboard with those that I can type on to, you know, feel. But anyway, that, that that's that's pretty much it. I have... I have like a mechanical keyboard here and at work as well. They're both, um, this one's a Razer, this is the original Razer Blackwood of Ultimate from like 2011 or whatever, it's the blue one. And then the one at work I have is a Corsair Strafe, I think. And it's like red and it's got the same uh, MX Blue switches in it. Okay, another multi-part question. Do you prefer writing code in higher level languages or lower level? Um, and why? That's a that's an interesting question. And I would have to answer that by saying I like the extremes, but maybe not so much the in-between. There is something to be said about writing really high-level stuff, because it's it's really fun, like, you know, writing stuff in Python, you know, on top of an OS, um, it's great because you can just focus on what you want to do, and there's all this support stuff below you, you can just invoke it, and it just works, and, you know, most of the time if you're using a good library. And, you know, you can just focus on how the program is structured and you don't have to worry too much about how it actually works. It just kind of figures it out. And that's always fun because it allows you to just get things done quickly, right? Same thing with Bash. I, I mean, I like scripting in Bash because it allows you to get, you know, complicated things done very quickly. Uh, but at the same time, I like writing low level. I like writing bare metal stuff, you know, directly on microcontrollers or, you know, on, uh, you know, FreeRTOS or some, you know, low level operating system like that because it's more challenging, it's more fun. I mean, you, you, you get to, you know, you read, read a data sheet, you get to learn how this peripheral works, you know, how it's memory mapped IO works. And then you have to, you know, think about timing and memory and all this other stuff. And, you know, you have to write a driver for it. And then you can solve problems using all that code that you've written. And it's, uh, it's, it's more satisfying seeing your code physically control like a real thing, um, rather than, you know, all this, all this, like, you know, software in a bubble that, you know, trickles down into something that happens. Um, so I, I like both of those, but the stuff in between is just kind of, it's, it's generic, right? Um, if I had the time and resources to redo my home lab from scratch, what would I do differently? Uh, realistically speaking, um, I would do a couple things. First of all, I would rack mount everything. I used to have some rack mount machines. I just stacked them. I never, I've never actually owned a rack. I would rack mount all my stuff, um, which would make it a lot neater. But I think the biggest thing I would do is I would probably put uh, Tesla, which is my main file server, I would buy a Storinator from 45 drives. Um, because it seems to be, at least as far as I know, the cheapest direct attach rack mount storage server that stores you know more than like 20 drives and is not super sketchy. Like I know Norco makes rack mount cases, but apparently their back planes are garbage and I don't want to dick around with that. So um, the the Storinator is probably something I still will actually buy eventually. Um, I have to save up some money for it, but I, I may eventually do it because I'm running out of storage space and I can't add any more drives into, into Tesla in the case it's got. So I've got to get a better, bigger case regardless. And so I think Storinator is probably the most future-proof solution. I want to... I want to use ECC memory in it, of course, because like, I should have ECC memory in it, um, and I've got to get a more powerful processor. Uh, it's not because the Pentium that's in there is too slow as far as CPU goes, it's actually the problem of PCI Express lanes, because of course, 
the piece, there, there's a decent number of PCI Express lanes that are run directly from the CPU, and uh, the Pentium does not have nearly enough lanes for what's actually in the system. Um, I think I'd say probably half the cards in that machine are running at like lower than their proper lane width because there's just not enough lanes to go around. So uh, I, I just I just need to sort of redo that. But everything else is kind of okay. Uh, I, I mean I, I'm I'm okay with everything. Maybe maybe I would get a managed switch instead of an unmanaged switch. That way I could set up VLANs and do do more uh, like do proper link aggregation instead of the weird round robin bullshit that I'm doing. Um, I mean, it still works. I mean, it, it still tolerates cable failures and all sorts of bullshit. But um, I mean, it's it's kind of okay. It's it's one of those things that I've just been slowly iterating on rather than doing it all at once. So eventually, I'll get it the way I want, and it'll just take a take a long time. Why did you start? Why did you decide to start your YouTube channels? Um, basically, because I've I've been watching YouTube for so long, and I always was learning from other people, and I kind of. I don't know, I wanted to join the community, I wanted to put things out there that were not already out there. And, you know, I just, I thought this was a, an interesting hobby to, to start out with and just see what happened. There was no way in hell you could have ever told me I would have had, like, you know, more than 100 people actually subscribe to this. I mean, literally, I, you, you, I would not have believed you. Um, because I thought I would just be putting stuff out there and there'd be, you know, the odd person who'd come across it, but... You know, things, I guess, happen, and so I guess now I'm, I'm kind of committed to this, I guess, at least for, for now, anyway. Um, what's the hardest technical challenge you have faced? Um, that's, that's probably not something I can actually answer, unfortunately, because um, that's under NDA, unfortunately. Sorry. Um... How do you separate sections of a complex electronic circuit to be easily understood? Um, honestly, it takes practice, realistically speaking. Um, what I would recommend you do is look, learn all of the sort of the basic building blocks of a circuit. So, you know, learn what a current mirror is, learn what a differential amplifier is. And, you know, you, you, know, you look, you know, know what, know what, know what a diode connected transistor does. And then you can look at a, a circuit and you can see these kind of cookie cutter building blocks and you can start to draw lines around them and sort of isolate what parts of the circuit you know, do what. And you can kind of turn it from a, you know, a device level circuit into a block level circuit and then you can sort of trace its higher level function from there. It, it's something that you honestly just need experience um, to be able to just look at a schematic and know how it works. I'm not very good at it uh, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but that's that's the way I was taught to do it, and I think that's probably still the best way that I know of, but I'm really not the guy to ask that kind of a question, to be honest. Um, do I use ECC memory? No, I don't, um, because uh, it's too expensive for me to implement now. I have to replace the CPU, the RAM, and the motherboard, which is not something that I'm particularly inclined to doing right at this moment, but I do want to do it at some point. Uh, best way to migrate from one set of a server to another? Um, Send receive? I mean, literally, just send the pool. Uh, it's like what it's designed for. Um, is it difficult to remove the L2 arc from a disk pool? No, no, it's like treated like cash. You can just run Z pool remove and just it's gone. Um, you can add and remove L2 arc at any time online. Super easy. Um, I'm going to come back to this question because I'm going to have to move the camera for that. Um, do you do any gaming under Linux? Uh, yes, yes I do. Um, I have Steam, of course. I prefer, um, I don't know, I, I guess I seem to prefer Valve games. Um, I really like the Portal series, right? Portal 1, Portal 2, and Portal Stories Mel, that community-made game. If you have not heard of it or played it, if you own Portal 2, it's free. It's basically an entirely separate game, and it is really, really well done. Uh, I mean, you know, for a community game, it's incredible. I've not actually done all the way yet. It's a, it's a long game. And uh, I also play Team Fortress 2 and, and stuff like that. And uh, they all run in Linux. They're all OpenGL, and they all seem to work pretty well. So uh, I don't do gaming as much as I used to, but uh, yeah, I, I do do gaming under Linux. Um, what's my favorite distribution? I would say Ubuntu for workstations and Debian for Linux, pretty much. Uh, 
What do you think of the ESPA266 and the ESP32? So uh, uh, the ESPA266 is really great because I mean, as far as uh, Wi-Fi modules go, I don't think you're gonna get any cheaper than that. Um, and it's got so many different SDKs. Uh, it's really great. I mean, if you wanna deploy something um, and it, you know, it doesn't require that much custom hardware, you can, put, you can put it down for just a couple dollars. I mean, you, know, you can use the extra code memory uh, in the in the micro that's not taken up by the TCP IP stack, and you can you know probably put your program in there if it's not too big. Um, it's it, they're they're really great things to play around with, and even if even if you don't use their SDKs, you know they are still a serial you know AT command based uh, Wi-Fi chip, and you can you know connect it to your own micro of whatever kind. Um, the ESP32 I have not ever used, but I do have a dev kit for the ESP32 coming from China in the mail. So I'm going to get it probably within the next month or two, and uh, I want to kind of play around with that. I haven't haven't really delved into that, but I'm going to probably. Uh, I think it runs. I think it runs free free RTOS. I think that's what the official Expressive SDK runs. So I'm going to play around with that. And uh, I said I wanted to make Wi-Fi headphones, so I, I may actually may actually try that. I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, what it's, what section do you advise going into for someone who's interested in many different things like security networking software embedded or how to choose? Um, if you like all of those things, why don't you do embedded software for networking security appliances? There you go. It uses everything. I, I, I don't know. Um, pick the thing you like the most, maybe? Um, what would you advise after doing a computer science degree to get into the industry? Um, a, a job in the industry. Um, if you can't get a job, then maybe do open source work or, or projects or something until you can convince an employer to hire you. I don't really know what that question really means, to be honest. Do I speak other languages, and if so, which? Um, no, I, I speak English. Uh, I took French, because it's, you know, it's mandated in Canada up until the ninth grade, and then I stopped taking it, and I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> So, no. Um, do you like anime? No. Um, what got you started with Linux and working with embedded electronics? I think I've pretty much already answered that. Um, how would a software developer with some electronics experience get started in the world of embedded software and electronics? What resources reading would you recommend? So, the way I would try this is Basically, get a microcontroller, and it, I don't really care what it is. I don't care if it's like a PIC or like an, an, an Atmel, like you know, AT Mega or AT Tiny, or like an STM uh, part from or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Get a simple microcontroller. Get like an eight-bit microcontroller, right? And you know, buy all of the support circuitry for it, um, like you know, like the, the oscillator, ca you know, bypass caps, power regulators, whatever you might need, and get the data sheet for it and you know read the data sheet understand how the processor works how you know if it's harvard architecture you know how the memory mapped uh you know peripherals work and basically start by writing drivers for that chip so you know write write drivers for the timers write drivers for the pwm write drivers for the uart and then write some simple application which utilizes those drivers to do something, right? The hello world application in the embedded world, you know, in, in the embedded world is basically flashing an LED at some like rate, right? That's kind of the first project you should probably aim at doing. And the reason, and the thing is, I should stress this, when you write your drivers, when you write all this code, you don't copy anybody. You don't copy paste any code. You do this entirely yourself, right? There's no Arduino in this. There's none of that stuff. There are no, no bootloaders. You write everything because what this will do is this will give you the understanding of how low-level software actually works. And there will be a point where everything will click and you'll, you'll, you'll understand how, how, how software and hardware directly work together. And once you get that, then you, know, you can work, you know, then you can start working on free RTOS or other types of uh, embedded like operating systems uh, or even Linux and stuff. And you still know how stuff works at the low level, but you can, you know, you can be aware of it and still work higher up. But until you actually work at the low level, um, you know, by doing, I think learning by doing is the best. And, and until you kind of learn that, um, 
you really won't understand uh, embedded software. Um, I don't really have any reading resources that I would recommend. I don't do a lot of reading, so I'm I'm not quite quite sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know um, about any you know, reading and stuff. Um, how do you figure out how to actually complete projects 100% instead of leaving them at 90% finished? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm guilty of the let's get it almost done and then give up and kind of be like, let's move on to something more interesting. So what I'm going to try is, uh, with starting with this, uh, this uh, gauge cluster project, I want to set my expectations, my initial expectations, way higher than normal. Because what I find is, if my initial expectation is make a gauge cluster, like I'm going to use this as an example, that displays CPU and RAM in real time, the current mess I've got on my desk meets that criteria. It's working. And so I'm inclined to just leave it the way it is because it meets my initial, uh, my initial requirements. But if my initial requirements were you know, something like, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, in in a, in a box that you can just plug in and it just works. Well, it, this clearly does not meet that requirement. So I have work to do and it's not done. So I'm just going to try and set my expectations way higher and hopefully um, I land somewhere, you know, above where I want and we'll see how that goes, I guess. Um, that's not a question. What happened to the kilowatt video? Okay, um, so... I, yeah, that was only up for a few hours because I, I kind of did a bit more looking at the circuit and I realized that I fucked up on the reverse engineering. Um, basically, the, the, there is a divider in that circuit. Um, to those who haven't watched the video, it's not important, but there's a divider in the circuit where half of it's on one board and half it's on the other board. And so the center node is in that connector. And um, so it's technically okay and there is a fuse on one side. So it actually is safe. I just fucked up. I didn't see that when I initially um, was doing the reverse engineering. So I just pulled the video because I don't want to spread misinformation. Um, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, already answered those questions. How do you feel about Ubuntu moving back to GNOME? I've already answered that. It's awesome. Why is ZFS so shit? Um, I'd say your shit, probably. Um, no, but re realistically, uh, you're probably using it wrong. Um, worst server-related horror story. <laughs> okay, um, well, okay, personally speaking, it's probably when the server caught fire. I mean, that, my, my file server when it caught fire, that was probably the worst thing. I mean, it could have gone really, really badly. Um, I mean, my house could have burned down, but... Uh, I don't actually regard that regard that as the worst server horror story, because uh, ultimately I didn't lose any data, um, right? I mean everything survived just fine. So I think the worst horror story. Um, I'm gonna obscure the details a little bit, uh, but this was a place that I used to work. We had a uh, we had a, a server rack and it had a bunch of like VM servers in it, and it had our primary file server for the organization. And this was a big 4U super micro machine, double, like, you know, it had drives on both sides. It was a massive machine. And it served um, over Samba, I think, at least three, 4,000 clients. It was a very, very busy machine. And anyway, we, we had to replace the rails on that rack because uh, they were the old style with the, the threaded holes, and we wanted to replace it with the new ones with the squares in them that stuff hooks into. So we were able to move all of the servers out of the rack except for this big file server uh, and the UPS is like that three-stage UPS where you know the UPS is like nine U high. We couldn't move that either, so um, we ended up just dropping the UPS on the floor. And for this big server, because uh, we couldn't move it, what we did was we put um, there's the, there are these braces on the on the this is a four-post rack, right? There were these braces that hold the rack together, and so we put a metal like bracer bar across that, and then we basically lowered the server onto that bar. Um, so that it wasn't resting on its rails anymore, and then we could wrestle out the, the server ra rack rails and put in the new ones. And so we did that, and we were getting the thing back in, into its original rail, and I don't know what, why, but we, we had to put it back down on this bracer bar at some point. I don't know, for some reason. I don't remember. This was a long time ago. And ultimately, we, uh, it was both me and someone else, because this thing's like 300 and something pounds, right? You can't lift this by yourself. 
and we misjudged where the bracer bar was, and the server ended up falling about two inches, no more than two inches. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but you got to remember that this thing is, you know, 300 something pounds with a bunch of 10,000 RPM, you know, spinning glass discs in it, right? And so we knew this was bad. But um, the thing is, the, the machine didn't complain. It contain, continued operating, uh, no problem. Um, so we thought, you know, we got lucky. Nothing seemed to have immediately died. And so, um, you know, we, we were finished. And uh, later that day, we had a, a short window um, uh, to do a, a reboot, basically apply security updates and reboot. The system was running FreeBSD with uh, ZFS, of course. And the system didn't come back after that reboot. And we tried for a while, um, not myself personally, um, our Unix system administrator did, was doing all this work. Um, so this is all secondhand account basically. But uh, he was unable to get the system back up and we ultimately had to fail over to our backup server, which had replicated about seven hours prior. So we ended up losing seven hours worth of data. Um, it was not super bad because of the time when we were doing this maintenance. I mean, we, we scheduled it in such a way that, you know, things like this would be minimized, but we did end up losing seven hours worth of data. And uh, the reason why it failed, uh, we don't actually know, per, like for, for absolute certainty, but there were, two, there were two problems that we discovered. The first one was um, the cables that we used, they were those uh, SFF8087 cables, um, those SAS cables that go between the backplane and the HBA. And the ones that we had were really shit and the latches were garbage and so they'd vibrate loose. And we think that, um, well, we know that some of those cables came out um, at some point because when we rebooted, the certain drive controller didn't find a decent number of drives. But all the pools were RAID Z3, or all the VDEVs were RAID Z3. So realistically speaking, it should have been okay missing all those disks. And so that shouldn't have been the reason why it didn't come up. Um, the real reason why we think it didn't come up was to do with um, the intent log. Now this, this was a long time ago. Um, so this is not a current problem that ZFS has, but it was a problem um, back in the day. If you lost the intent log, you also lost the pool. That was just the way it was. Um, nowadays, if you lose the intent log, you lose the data that was on the intent log, but not the pool itself. And uh, so we had two SSDs that were mirrored that made up the intent log and they both failed simultaneously. Um, they didn't come back after the controller reset. And so we lost the intent log and therefore we lost the pool. And that's probably the primary reason why it did not come back. Um, so yeah, I mean, we ultimately ended up upgrading ZFS and, and I don't think that's ever happened again or can ever happen again. But uh, yeah, that was the worst, that was the worst story that I think I have. Um, are you French? No, I'm Canadian. Um, uh, will I be walking through how I built my thermostat? Yeah, I literally said that in the last video. Um, answered that, which Linux distro has the best hardware support? Um, I don't really know. It's probably going to be, I mean, any of the big ones, uh, Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora. I mean, anything that's got a big giant ass generic kernel in it where they basically just check all the boxes and compile all the stuff into the kernel. Um, those probably have the best hardware support. Um, can I compare OpenSense and PFSense? No. No, I don't want to do that. Um, do you also back up your NAS via other means, such as off-site replication or saving a copy in a fire safe? So I have send receive, which goes to my backup server. Uh, that's, automa that's automated. Um, I talked about that earlier. Um, I do have uh, sort of a, a manual kind of uh, backup strategy where I copy things to uh, older disks. And I'm, I'm a, a fire save is currently on my wish list. Uh, it's something that I do wanna do. Uh, they're currently not in a fire save. I do have some stuff in, in, in a safety deposit box, but uh, not as much as I want. So yeah, fire save is the thing that I will eventually be getting, but eh, it's a thing that's on my list. Uh, next question, what is your worst screw up regarding a project? Uh, I mean, I make mistakes all the time. I just usually catch them, um, you know, before, you know, during development and, you know, before the project goes out. Um, I'd say one of the bigger sort of late stage problems I had that was pretty dumb was I was just doing an industrial control system. This was uh, many, many years ago. 
Um, and it was really simple. It was just a bunch of relays and a microcontroller, really. I mean, it was nothing more complicated than that. I thought it was just you know easy to bang it out, and uh, code was really simple. And and you know I get the pro I get the prototype, and the bloody thing crashes, and I can't figure out why. And it took me a while to realize that I forgot the RC snubber networks on the relay contacts. So every time the the relays opened and closed, they'd spit out some EMI, and every once in a while, um, they would crash the micro. And so, uh, yeah, I uh, I definitely I definitely uh, screwed that one up. But I just bodged on some caps and, and some resistors, and it was okay. But um, that was pretty that was pretty late stage um, where I discovered that. Uh, already answered that. Why don't you use a Red Hat-like distribution like CentOS on your servers? Um, because CentOS is like, okay, if Debian is considered ancient, then CentOS is like prehistoric. Um, like, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's really old. Um, no other reason. Uh, I also tend to like Debian-based stuff. Um, I just, I like the dev packages. I like apt. I just, I just, I don't know. I just like Debian-based stuff. Um, and I've already answered that one. A lot of people are wondering about Unity in GNOME. It's kind of interesting. Um, do you have a wife and kids? Uh, no, I do not. Um, how do I explain to my friends that vinyl does not sound better than CD? Um, I honestly don't know. <laughs> if you find out, uh, let me know. Maybe, I don't know, Take get one of those like phone apps or something that like makes makes things sound like vinyl by basically just adding in a bunch of shit into the sound and be like, yeah, does this really sound better? And I don't know, maybe they'll... I want to see someone defend that, right? Get get something that, like, intentionally you can just turn on and off and go, normal versus hissing and popping and crackling and wow and flutter and all this other stuff and, you know, good, bad, and, like, def have them defend the bad one. And uh, I'd love to hear people's excuses about that. That would be pretty fun. Um... How is your NTP GPS module working now? Uh, it I pulled it out of service um, several months ago um, because apparently, for some reason, the the NVRAM that's on that thing uh, is apparently not non-volatile, uh, and it just decided to one day just reset itself. So uh, it's uh, it, it was of course inverts the pulse and everything, and so it doesn't work properly anymore. And uh, it's kind of a bitch for me to set that thing up because because the uBlock software only works in Windows, so I've got to get a VM set up and all that stuff to pass the USB device through. And it's one of those things I'll I'll fix eventually and get it set up again. But I, it's just been sitting in a box somewhere. Um, so I, I since I moved actually, so I just don't have time to deal with it right now. Um, I already answered that. Answered that. What OS do you recommend? Take a guess. Um, what was your first job and how did you get it? Um, I did a lot of stuff as a kid, so I don't really know what my first job was because I did a lot of stuff um, sort of at the same time. I I know I worked in a warehouse. I used to pack and ship orders. Um, and I, I got that job because my dad worked at the company. Um, but I also did I also did a bit of IT work at the time for some small businesses. I also did web development. I did freelance web development back then. And I continued that for a while um, before I eventually sort of hated doing front-end stuff. Uh, and then I eventually switched to doing back-end stuff. Um, uh, I, I guess I could turn this into what, what jobs have I worked, I guess. Um, I, I also used to do... I used to do custom PC stuff. I used to build custom PCs. I did, like, liquid loops and stuff for, for just random people. I did, I did uh, PC repair... And I did data recovery services for a while, and then, and then I did. Uh, of course, I, I did the web development, and then I didn't really like the front end stuff. So then I worked mostly in in, in back end web for a while, and um, I then kind of worked like in 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 kind of digital signage for a bit. Um, I designed a digital signage platform. I uh, I worked IT. I worked in help desk. I was a tier one help desk for a while. Um, that was only a part time though. And then, then I worked for a multimedia equipment manufacturer, doing um, test engineering. So that was when I worked in basically QA. Um, I then worked at a medical equipment manufacturer. So they designed embedded systems that worked in uh, uh, hospitals and operating operating rooms and stuff like that. Um, 
so I did software for that and uh, you know now I do uh, embedded software uh, design so that's that's pretty much that's pretty much my career so far um, what are the main differences between ZFS ButterFS and MD RAID plus LVM what do you recommend for beginners building first cheap data storage server okay um, MD RAID I mean MD RAID is the probably the best software RAID that's out there but I mean, it's, it's RAID. It's fundamentally broken by design, in my opinion. Uh, I never really got a chance to use LVM that much um, because I, I moved to ZFS pretty quickly. ButterFS, I mean, it was a great attempt, but I think ButterFS got put into the kernel way too quickly. Um, it, it was, no, it was it's unmaintainable code, really. It, it's kind of awful looking. It's got lots of problems, and, um, you know... I don't know if I'll ever be able to trust it. I mean, I know that they're they're fixing it. It's getting better. You know, eventually certain parts will probably be rewritten. But to me, ButterFS is just going to be a less stable alternative to ZFS, in my opinion. Um, I mean, it's got the ability to rebalance storage pools and stuff, which is really great. But I could, you know, to be honest, by the time ButterFS becomes trustworthy, maybe ZFS will implement those features. I don't know. Um, I really don't know. I, I, but I would, I would, I would absolutely recommend ZFS. Because it is by far the simplest thing to do. I mean, it's almost kind of like SQL, where you pretty much just tell the system what you want, and it does it for you. It figures out how to do it for you. Um, and it, the, the admin is so easy. It's just, and it's 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 pretty much bulletproof at this point. So, yeah, that's what I would do. Um, let's see. Uh, blah 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 blah. PF sense crap. You're not sure if the cache on Squid is working or not. Um, how do you I'm assuming you're asking like how do you tell if Squid's working um, and the I guess try make sure you're using HTTP stuff because there's one, one big thing with Squid is that the transparent proxy only works if you're using unencrypted traffic right? as soon as you use HTTPS you can't cache that anymore because you can't effectively man in the middle of your own traffic you need to have a self-signed cert on your router that you then add to all of the devices and you set up a, uh, a proper proxy on all of your devices to use that cache. So, um, yeah, I don't really know what's going on about that. Um, do I recommend PFSense for enterprise businesses of over 500 users? Um, damn right I do. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't, can't really answer your question. Um, what network protocol, e.g. NFS, and what cloud application, e.g. own cloud, do you use for my file server Tesla? Um, so Tesla serves NFS for all of the devices that are like permanently attached to it. Um, and I also have Samba doing which does SMB. And I use that primarily because my Android phone, um, a lot of apps support SMB over like on Android, but not NFS. So I have that just so that I can you know stream stuff to my phone. Um, and as for cloud applications, I don't use any. I, I kind of looked at own cloud at one point, but I don't really have the need for it. Uh, realistically speaking, I will just like, uh, you know, SSH into a machine, you know, SFTP files on and off the machine. I don't have the need for uh, like an in-browser type cloud thing. Um, I, I just I just don't need the, don't need it. Um, you want to become a system admin or network engineer? Any tips from my side? Um, I, I haven't really kind of worked as either of those. I mean, a little, did a little bit of sysadmin, but not super, super much. Um, honestly, as far as tips go, I think this applies to pretty much any job. Um, but automate the living shit out of everything. Um, you need to learn all of the tools that are out there. So all the DevOps tools like Puppet and Chef and SaltStack and uh, you know, really learn how to do bash scripting, uh, script stuff in Python. Basically take as much of your job and make a computer do it as possible. Because ultimately, especially if you're a sysadmin or a network engineer, if some, when shit hits the fan, you wanna have a, a script that you can just run and not have to think about it and it will solve the problem. Um, or or you know, you know, for doing backups and stuff, you wanna make sure that everything is done properly every time. So you want it to be done by a computer because you don't wanna make a mistake. Um, and you know, in the middle of a crisis, um, you don't want to have to remember exactly the procedure to do something because uh, if you know if you screw it up then you know that's on you but if you have a script that does it the script's not going to screw up you want to make it as simple as possible 
Um, and of course, you want to, you know, your company is going to pay you to do high level thinking that a machine can't do. So you want to automate all of the boring crap out of your job. Um, so, I mean, and it goes for any job. I mean, literally, it doesn't matter if you were like a receptionist. I mean, honestly, I think everybody should have some level of coding skills to be able to automate parts of their job because that's ultimately where we're going as a society. So that's, that's my take on it. But really, I don't have, I don't have any more tips than that probably. What the hell are these questions? Do I have a stock in this pharmaceutical company? No. Is, it, is this trolling? I'm not actually quite sure. What's your favorite organic solvent? It's probably benzene. Because benzene, I mean, it's super carcinogenic. Like, it will give you cancer, but it also, damn, like, it cleans stuff real well. Um, could I recommend some literature or courses online that could teach you the basics of electricity? Um, I don't really know of any, but I'm sure Google has an answer for you. Um, like if, if you just want to learn, you know, basic electricity, you know, you're going to learn about current potential difference, you know, conductance, resistance, and then, then you could go into, you know, AC signals, you learn phaser analysis and, and, you know, imaginary power and power factor and all that crap. I'm, like, I'm sure that there's so many, there's so much stuff that's got to be out, out there on that stuff. I mean, I find that most most stuff at least on youtube and other stuff there's it's kind of like uh whenever you look at tech it's kind of like an inverse upside down triangle right at the top at the very high level you've got a large amount of content and then as you go down to the more specific stuff at the bottom there's less content right so that stuff seems pretty high level so i expect there to be a lot of stuff out there um but i can't help you with that directly um editor so i use uh I use pretty much two, three editors. Um, I do most of my work in uh, a kind of small IDE known as KDevelop. Um, if you want to try it out, which I highly recommend, um, you can go to their website and download an app image. Um, don't get it from the repos because it's not currently uh, up to date. They have version 5 out, which I don't think is in the repos of most OSs yet. But KDevelop, is a, it's a great IDE because it's, it's just complicated enough, but it doesn't try to do everything. That's a big problem I've had with a lot of IDEs, especially things like Eclipse and NetBeans and stuff. They try to take over your build environment. And realistically speaking, I've got you know, continuous integration servers and stuff. Um, and you know at work, we've got big tool chains that are already pre-set up and everything. You know, we don't want Eclipse to come in and try and screw with our make system and try and you know, do its own shit. We don't want that. We have our own you know, command that runs a build. So, all I want is an IDE that you can just say easily, here you go, run this, and that's all That's that's all you need to do for building. And KDevelop does that. Um, but it also has, I mean, it's got, it's built on Qt 5. It's got really great interface. It's got uh, libsublime, uh, it uses libsublime, so it's got like the mini map for the scroll bars, got really good search and replace, which is very important. Um, it has lots and lots of language support. So I use it pretty much for all of my C, C++, Python, uh, you know, HTML, PHP, um, JavaScript, all that stuff. Uh, I use Bash, all that stuff I do, do in KDevelop. Um, I still use NetBeans when I work with Java because uh, it, it's still, I think, the best Java IDE out there. And uh, I use Android Studio if I'm doing Android dev. Um, it's based on IntelliJ, but I mean, it's kind of the official thing to, to use. And um, when I'm working in, in particularly when I'm working with the, the XC compilers for microchip pick parts, I use microchips IDE, which is MPLabX. And MPLabX is literally just NetBeans with an like extra level of crap on it to support their embedded parts. So uh, it's, it's, I just, th those are the IDEs that I use for pretty much everything. But KDevelop kind of like changed the way I do coding. Um, it's, it's just perfect. I, I know some people are going to say, well, what about Sublime? What about Vim? What about Emacs? All that crap. If I'm in a, a just a regular text console, I will use Vim. Um, I, I could never get into Emacs. Um, so I use Vim for everything. Uh, but um, yeah, for, for, as, far, as far as Sublime goes, Sublime is fine, but I think you got to pay for the pro version or whatever, I think. And it doesn't have as many features, I think, as KDevelop does. So you can make KDevelop look like Sublime and, and act like Sublime and stuff. Um, you've got to go into the settings. 
Um, like that, that, I guess that's the big thing with KDevelop is it's got all of the settings you want to change, but it doesn't have all this extra bloat that you have no idea what it does. Um, you know, I go in and I change almost all of the settings, but I can turn it into exactly what I want, and that's why I use that ID. And it's it's pretty stable, so um, that's good. Um, GIF or GIF? Okay, it stands for Graphical Interchange Format, not Peanut Butter. It's GIF. Um, if you had one option, redundancy or backup? Oh, okay, I hate questions like this because it's kind of a question that honestly you should never have to deal with. Um, but redundancy is not a backup. So ultimately I would have to say backup. Now, it's really not about the backup, right? It's about the restore. Um, it's kind of like, um, I think a Google engineer a couple years ago talked about this, um, where they basically they basically said that that it's all about the restore, right? The backup is just a tax you have to pay for the luxury of a restore. So, you know, redundancy does not give you as high a chance of recovering your data as a proper uh, offline backup. So, I would have to go with backup on that. If I'm wiring my house for a new home network, is it worth the extra to get CAT6 or is CAT5e still a good standard? Okay, so all of the cable that I have is CAT6a um, or CAT6e. Um, so all of the all of the uh, yellow cable back there is, um, I think it's Mohawk Advanced Net um, Plenum cable. It's all solid core CAT6a or 6e. Um, and uh, all of the white stuff is all Cat6, Cat6 as well. Um, I don't have any Cat5e left. Cat5e, it maxes out at a gigabit. Um, whereas Cat6a, I believe, goes up to 10 gig, I believe. So um, the thing is, there's those new standards that uh, were just finalized not very long ago for, I believe, 2.5 and 5 gig Ethernet, right? They're those intermediary standards. and. I think it's only going to be a matter of a couple of years before we start seeing high-end computer motherboards and stuff that ship with you know 2.5 and 5 gig uh, network cards, and uh, you know ultimately land speeds are start are going to start to increase. And you know if you have if you have Cat6, you can easily just you start using them. You don't have to rewire your house. But if you're using Cat5, you are stuck with gigabit forever. So I mean the price difference I don't think is that astronomically different. Um, I haven't checked the prices in a long time, but uh, I would personally go with with Cat Six if I planned on living there for a long time. Um, you know, if you're only going to be there for like a year, then yeah, go with the cheapest ship possible. But um, otherwise, I would probably go with Cat Six. Um, uh, let's see. Why did you decide to build this awesome network of yours? Because I needed a network. Um, I mean, I needed a network. I needed I needed to connect my servers to something. Um, I I I always have wanted to run my own infrastructure. Um, I have serious trust issues with pretty much all companies, um, and I don't give them my data. Um, basically, I don't want them to have have you know complete control over my data or access to my data if they provide like a service or something. So uh, basically, the only way to really protect yourself is ultimately to do it yourself, and uh, you know it, it, it gives you a really good ex you know level of experience. I mean, you can you know you learn a lot by managing your own infrastructure, uh, and also you know you can do whatever you want with it. You're not subject to somebody's terms of service, and uh, you know you don't have you know probably don't have the government um, spying on you all the time. So that's kind of nice. Um, it's just. It's just a thing that I, I I've always kind of done, and uh, it's kind of it's kind of cool, you know. If if something goes wrong or whatever, you know, it's only on you. You are solely responsible for your data, and you know, someone else's screw up somewhere doesn't affect you. Um, and you know, having your data locally and your services locally means that if your internet goes down or a provider goes offline, you still have access to all your stuff, um, which is very important, of course. Okay, so this is a big question. Um, favorite three or so non-fiction books? 
Uh, actually, there's a lot of books in this question. I don't read stuff uh, anymore. I used to, uh, but it's kind of one of those things I've ran out of kind of time for. Um, nonfiction, I really don't remember, honestly. I think the last nonfiction book I read was... I think it was American on Purpose by Craig Ferguson. That was back when he was on The Late Late Show. Um, and I can't remember reading nonfiction books before that, honestly. Um, as far as fiction goes, um, I think probably the last fiction book I read was probably... I think it was Digital Fortress by Dan Brown. It's not technically accurate, but it is a, it's, it's an interesting book. Um, I also used to read a lot of books by guy named Dean Kunst. He did like sci-fi mystery books and stuff. And some of those are pretty good. Um, uh, favorite technical books. Again, I, I don't really read technical books. Um, I mean, I, I mean, of course, like I remember like textbooks and stuff back when I was in university, but I don't, I don't really seem to read technical books now. I mean, I use the internet for most of what I want to learn. Um, it's it's just generally faster to find what you want, and it's generally more more up to date. Um, I guess I guess if you're looking for if you're looking for learning circuits, um, there's a book called uh, Microelectronic Circuits by Cedra and Smith, and that's kind of like the bible for circuits. It is technically a textbook, but you can read that, and I mean that's that's some pretty great technical um, reading if you want to know about digital or analog circuit design. Um, I mean, it was written by part of the part by Adele Cedra, who's kind of like a like a legend, basically. A um, uh, few favorite bands. Okay, I will do you one better on this question, and I will put a link in the description of this video, which links to my last FM profile, um, which will give you real time statistics on everything that I've listened to since 2012. Um, that's when I started using the service. So it doesn't have anything before that, so it's not totally accurate, but it's close. Um, it'll give you an idea of what music I listen to. Um, and it's real statistics, so I can't lie. Um, I don't use Last.fm for actually streaming music because I think streaming is stupid, but Clementine scrobbles everything that I play to that, and you know I have an app on my phone which also does the same thing. Um, will you share a playlist that you listen to often? Uh, again, go to the last FM uh, profile, view like I don't know top tracks, and turn that into a playlist. Whatever. Um, what tech news sources do you trust? None of them. Um, I, I've come to the point where you can't really trust anything that you read anymore. You've got to fact check stuff. I mean, there are some places that I think are more reputable than others, like ours and stuff. But ultimately, I mean, you've got to. If you're utilizing what you're reading in an important way, you need to just just check either what other people are thinking about it or uh, the facts in it directly. Even if it's just reading comments about the article on Reddit, you know, l see if other people disagree or if other people have done research for you about what's in it. Um, yeah, it. I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't generally care about like rumors and stuff like that because it's generally not that that big a deal to me. I wait until there's really hard evidence, but still hard evidence and stuff can still kind of be faked and skewed and, and stuff. So just, just you know, I guess be careful. I don't really trust anybody. Um, where do you go to keep you informed about tech industry news? So I work in embedded software, so I'm subscribed to, um, there's a monthly newsletter um, called uh, the, uh, the Embedded Muse. It's run by uh, Jack Gansel at the Gansel Group. Um, it's a free newsletter, so you just subscribe to it, and uh, it's it's articles by like real engineers and stuff, um, and it's just it's just it's it's good it's good to read. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff in it, and you can view the archives all the way back. Um, I mean, it's if you if you work in embedded software and you don't know who Jack Ansel is, you need to fix that probably. Um, what is your ideal Sunday? I don't really know. Maybe getting some some. I don't know, doing some cool project, you know, relaxing, watching TV at the end of the day, not doing a lot, sleeping, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Just, I don't know. Yeah, relaxing and getting stuff done, being productive, something like that. Um, 
What would you recommend as a server web GUI for a Debian-based server? I don't use web GUIs, so I don't know. Um, I think the closest I've ever gotten is I use I use Monitrix, which is some like ancient tool for doing server monitoring. Uh, you know, everyone now uses Grafana, which is something that I'll eventually probably switch to, but that's another project at some point. But I don't use web GUIs. Um, and what software would you consider essential for a server owner? Um, if you don't know what fail to ban is, you need to fix that. Um, that's like probably the most important thing that you could install. Um, any chance you could do a quality of service setup video in PFSense? Uh, maybe. Um, answered that already. Answered that already. Um, I don't really think a tour of. Nah, you know what? Okay, I'll come back to that as well because I got two questions I got to come back to when I got to move the camera. I'll answer that then. Why do you use the term Linux instead of GNU plus, plus Linux? Um, I'm kind of, of course, there's going to be a gray beard or neck beard person who's going to ask this question. There's two reasons. First one is, it sounds stupid. Simple as that, right? There, there, to some extent, there is a convenience factor and a, you know, to some extent, that, that, that is a thing. But the other, the other point is, you've got to, I mean, I absolutely respect Richard Stallman and I respect the GNU project. By all means, I mean, GCC, core utils, super important. But when you look at a system now, how much software on it is actually part of GNU and how much of it is not part of GNU? I mean, I would say that there's a lot of non-GNU software on these machines. And so you get to the point where, okay, it runs Linux at the core and now I'm giving attribution to GNU, but does that mean I should also start giving attribution to all the other projects that are on the system? And so do we start building this, you know, this giant name of this conglomerate of all the things that's running on the system, right? You don't, you don't do that, right? You just call it by what it is at its core. And Linux is sort of seems to be what people accept, um, you know, to call it. And that's what I go with. Um, you know, it's not that I don't respect GNU. It's just that I think, you know, it's, it's just kind of a dumb name. Um, do I have recommendations uh, of books or tutorials for learning basic electronics and microcontroller programming? I, I don't have book recommendations. Google it, I guess. Any tips on how to learn soldering? Any recommendation of equipment? Um, Google is your friend um, for learning soldering. As far as equipment goes, get a temperature controlled soldering station. Don't use one of those cheap, you know, plug into the wall direct things. Those are ga garbage. Um, you know, you can get a, don't, don't, don't go out and buy like a $600, like, you know, hey, you know, Heiko branded thing. Um, you can get like a Chinese, you know, soldering station with hot air reflow and everything for like a hundred bucks. Um, and that's what I use. Like I use like a Yeehaw brand or I don't know how you say it. And it works fine. Like it works fine. Um, and the thing is, ultimately, you're you're probably gonna screw stuff up. All right, you're gonna destroy the tips you probably start out with because you're not gonna know what you're doing. But um, yeah, don't buy expensive stuff at the beginning. But don't buy, don't use, you know, don't learn on crap stuff. But at the same time, don't buy stupid, ridiculous stuff because uh, it's not like it's kind of like the whole like camera DSLR thing, right? When you go out and buy like a four thousand dollar DSLR camera, it doesn't instantly make you a good photographer, right? Um, you can make better pictures if you know how, but it doesn't make you better. So don't go out and buy a super expensive soldering station. It's not going to make you better at soldering. It's just going to cost you a lot more money. It's not going to help you. Um, once you learn how to solder, then maybe you know if you do it a lot, then get something nice and treat yourself. But um, that's that's I guess my recommendation. Do I plan to move from Debian to Ubuntu on the desktop? Uh, yeah, like I said, probably not if they don't manage to screw it up. Um, I already answered that. Any advice going freelance? No, sorry. Um, I don't know. I don't know enough about that. Um, it's been a long time since I was freelance, so I, I don't really have anything to give you there. Um, and more about will I continue PFSense? And the answer is still maybe. So that was the uh, the 80 comments. So I'm going to uh, get the camera and I'm just going to go back to those two questions that I skipped over. Okay, so the question that I skipped over was related to, um, you know, what is in my rig. And I don't think I've actually shown this before. Um, so this is this is Volta. This is my main my main workstation. Um, so it's the same case. It's the same Corsair 750D as what Tesla runs. Because uh, this is uh, you know I, I like this case. It's kind of nice. 
So, oh, I'm just under my desk here. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to take this window off because it's easier to see without the reflection of the plastic window. So, um, yeah, so it's just a Seasonic 650-watt G-Series power supply. Is that too bright? Oh, there we go. So it's just a modular power supply. And then uh, I've got my uh, HP NC360T dual port uh, gigabit NIC, and then I've got um, my, uh, I don't remember the model number of that. It's my dual port um, InfiniBand uh, DDRX4 card. And then I've got uh, an ASUS, it's a GeForce GTX 1060. I had to upgrade to this when I got my 4K monitor because I had a 750Ti, which unfortunately, um, the 750Ti um, doesn't support uh, HDMI 1.2, I believe is what's needed to get 60 FPS over HDMI at 4K. So I had to just upgrade the whole graphics card, which is kind of shitty. And then I've got my uh, Zoner SSSTX card, which I modded a while back, and that sits up there. And uh, the motherboard is a, uh, it says Asus Z79, I think. I can't see where the model is exactly. It's got 16 gigs of uh, G-Skill 2133 megahertz um, memory. Uh, and of course, it's uh, got a custom liquid cooling loop here um, just to pump there. I've got a dual 120 mil rad on the front, which is a, a high density 30 FPI copper rad. And then I've got a, uh, just a, a, a coolant uh, in, in bay regulator or a reservoir, sorry, in here, and it's uh, I use their their coolant. Um, this is the blue coolant in here, and so it uh, it exhausts here, and I kind of do need to clean that. But yeah, it draws air in the front um, to try and keep it positive pressure in here, which it does a decent job of. So yeah, that's that's basically this system. It's got an Intel 180 gig um, SSD back there. And that's the only storage in this. Everything else is just over InfiniBand. Um, so that's that's my primary work workstation. And um, the CPU, by the way, is a uh, it's an Intel Core i7 4790K. Um, so that's 4.4 uh, gigahertz, eight cores, and the the cooling can keep it at that turbo frequency all the time, uh, if need be. So uh, this is what I do all my video editing and stuff on. Um, I use Caden Live, by the way. Uh, people have asked that in the past. So um, I use that. It's slow as hell. The, end, the, the the melt framework is awful, but it's Linux, so what can you do? There really isn't that much um, in the way of good video editors on Linux that you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for. But uh, yeah, that's that's my workstation. So that's it. Um, thanks for all your questions. Uh, hopefully you got the answers that you wanted. Um, you know, if, if people want, maybe I'll do this again in a year's time or something, um, and we'll see what's changed. But uh, yeah, that's it for this video. So, as always, thanks for watching.